celebration stuff to inform us about? Really quickly, I think it went well. It was um, a lively conversation, I would say, at, at the end of it. Um, I had a good time, and I believe it's recorded and living somewhere if you want to see it. So I do. If you can send me the link when you receive it, that would be awesome. Thank you. Will do. Um, sure. Uh, we, ha we had uh, over 450 uh, people on Zoom last night for um, Sarah Zodi's uh, talk. Uh, she uh, spoke on uh, Olmsted's um, travels and, uh, in, in the Cotton Kingdom South and his writings, his very influential writings, and um, made a really interesting presentation on, on how um, you know, that part of Olmsted is often talked about separately from his parks design. And she made a really compelling argument of how it informed uh, his thinking about uh, uh, parks. And so that was a, it was a great event. We had people from all over the country. Um, let's see, next Monday, we're gonna have our first live event um, since 2019 in Steeplejack Brewery, uh, which um, if you haven't been there is really a spectacular uh, 1906 uh, 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 Unitarian Universalist church. Uh, that's been converted into a brewery and we'll have um, uh, Catherine McNoor and uh, Carl Abbott uh, speaking on uh, Olmsted. Uh, Catherine's written a great book um, on antebellum New York and uh, has devoted considerable research to uh, Central Park and, and some of the um, not I mean, kind of everybody knows about Seneca Village, uh, you know, these days. But there's a lot of other impacts that uh, Central Park had, both on, on, um, you know, folks in New York at the time, and and sort of practices in parks since then. And then uh, Carl, if you don't know him, is uh, really our one of our great public historians in Portland. He's written numerous books on on Portland, and so he's really going to contextualize the 1903 Parks Report. Uh, so that should be great. If you can't, um, you know, make it to the brewery, it'll be on Zoom. Uh, as well in our first hybrid event, which I'm <laughs> hopefully will go off flawlessly. We're learning all the technology of doing that. Um, and then on uh, March 28th, uh, uh, Corbin makes a return visit to um, the Olmsted um, uh, uh, series uh, along with Vivek Shandas, um, who you all probably know as um, uh, chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. And they'll be talking about uh, uh, kind of getting beyond recreation in parks, thinking about uh, uh, social justice and climate change um, and parks in the future. So I'm really looking forward to that. And we're still working on an indigenous program uh, sometime in April, but uh, I'm still figuring that one out. So um, that's the update from Olmsted Land. Thank you, Randy. Um... And I didn't think I had any um, announcements, but actually, I guess I did want to update folks that the um, representative Nelson had put in the request initially for $33 million um, to help fill the gap for a North Portland Aquatic Center. Um, that got pared down to 15 million um, because the 33 million was just too big of a stretch. Um, but the 15 million did pass, which is good news, of course, but you know, again, there's still a gap. So, um, you know, I don't know if Todd intends to address that a little bit when he fills in um, for Director Long to provide the director support um, or, you know, but, you know, I, I expect we'll be hearing hearing more um, on that topic. Um, I see Sabrina's hand up. Yeah, I wanted to share um, a little bit of personal news in terms of the Rosewood Initiative. And I think there's a little bit of relevancy to parks because we work very closely with them in terms of programming. Um, but we just announced that we are going to be moving locations, the Rosewood Community Center. Um, really exciting news because we're gonna be on our path towards ownership. So once we reach our fundraising goal, um, we will own our new property. Um, and how that relates to parks, one I just wanted to share with all of the different spaces that I'm in, but We've worked um, very closely with parks for a long time in terms of programming, especially like um, the arts and culture realm and like our music classes that happen currently out of Rosewood. We have guitar lessons. And so we're really gonna be continuing that work 
and really rethinking as well on how to expand that programming on the outer East Portland area. Um, as you all know, there's the East Portland Community Center, but that's still closer to inner Portland than, than the area that we serve. And so really exciting news um, for Rosewood and to continue the parks programming happening in outer East Portland. So I just wanted to share that with this group. Thanks. Thank for you, Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina. That's wonderful news and congratulations to the Rosewood Initiative. Um, as, as the organization has matured, it's been really exciting, some of the things that um, you folks have done. And, and indeed, you're correct that East Portland, you know, we think of East Portland as one thing, but it's a very large area and the area between where the East Portland Community Center is and out where the Rosewood Initiative is, is really vast. So that's, that's terrific news. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Any other announcements? If not, um, I hope you all had a chance to review the minutes from the February meeting. Um, wanted to see if anyone had any comments, corrections, revisions to those. If not, I will entertain a motion from the floor to approve the minutes as submitted. So move. Thank you, Patty. Any second? I'll second. I'll second. Oh, a second and a third. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, any discussion? If not, um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay, minutes are approved. Um, and as we heard, uh, Director Long was unable to join us because there is a budget work session, I think, um, that all the directors are needing, were, were called to. Um, so Todd is gonna present the director's report in her stead. Todd? Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, yes, Director Long's at a budget work session. We're actually participating in four this month. Today is about building resilient infrastructure. We have one later this week about community safety and emergency response. All the community safety bureaus are participating in that. Then there's one on the 17th about supporting livable neighborhoods. And we had one last week about climate resiliency. And so Director Long's covering that budget work session today. As Bonnie mentioned, the Oregon legislature passed a bill uh, for $15 million for the North Portland Aquatic Center, which is great news. Uh, Commissioner Rubio had already pledged $11.7 million to that project. So we still need to raise about 23 million more to build the $50 million new North Portland Aquatic Center. Uh, Rep Representative Travis Nelson uh, led that effort and thanks to many of you who signed on to the letter of support. I know Nike, Portland Public Schools, many others in the community, I believe over a thousand people co-signed co uh, the letter for that project. Pretty much turned around that from like 72 hours. So amazing community support for that. So thankful for that. We have four items coming up at City Council uh, this month. Uh, one of them is to put out to bid our uh, golf course operators at Colwood, East Moreland, Heron Lakes, and Rose City golf courses. And so this will be the first, first time in a long time that we've ever put out uh, all four courses together. And so we're looking forward to that. We also have uh, item that council just administratively cleaning up uh, some of our teen grant programming related to additional funding they received during the pandemic. On March 16th, uh, we're doing a citywide tree canopy report to council, uh, which will, we've done some great research on urban forestry to describe uh, kind of the waning of the urban forest. And so we've, uh, Sadly, maybe for the first time, not been growing the forest, but it's actually in a state of decline. And so we'll do a re informational report for council, and then we expect some further action in the coming months around that topic. Um, and then uh, we're bringing an agreement with Hopper and Landscape Conservancy, uh, where they provide 
uh, support, repair and maintenance support for the fountains and surrounding park areas for the Por Portland open space sequence. So that's a great partnership we'll be bringing this month as well. Relating to COVID, um, the Bureau, as expected, has slowed to ha have cases over the last month. Um, over the last two weeks, uh, we've had 28 intakes and six confirmed po positive cases, and hopefully that continues to go down. As you're all aware, uh, this Saturday marks the end of the mask mandate for most indoor settings in Oregon, including schools and the city will be in alignment with those state guidelines. This means that community members and most employees at city facilities can make their own decision about whether to wear a mask, except in special bureau specific circumstances, they might be still required to wear a mask. As of last week, unvaccinated staff who received an accommodation will still be required to wear facial coverings and um, the lifting of the mandate comes a few weeks before the re-entry of our office workers and city-owned facilities, which will be happening in early April. Some of you may have seen in uh, news reporting the state of Oregon for their employees is lifting the vaccination requirement for state workers. Uh, the city hasn't made a determination on how we're going to proceed on that yet. An update from Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland work. Uh, the listening and learning team is now preparing for wave two of community listening and learning, which will begin in March and continue through June. Thanks to all of you that served on the mission, vision, values, and racial equity statement team. Uh, they used uh, the community listening to guide drafting of new statements. And the team also drafted some initial outcome statements for the Bureau. These drafts are being shared in the community engagement processes uh, in the coming months. It was also shared with the action and results team who kicked off their work uh, February 24th and they'll be looking at our strategic framework and brainstorm how to fill some of the gaps in that framework and help us prioritize our work. This team includes staff from across the Bureau and also representatives from community. We expect the division will be focused on this work uh, or all of our divisions will be focused on this work in spring, summer, and early fall. And we hope to be working with you during that time as well. You may recall the decision support tool team uh, piloted uh, the tool uh, during our budget processes the past two rounds, and this team will reconvene later in 2000 or later this year uh, to make additional adjustments to the tool. On March 9th and 10th, coming up tomorrow and Thursday, uh, we'll have all employee gatherings. The objective of these gatherings is to build employee morale after lots of challenges the past few years. Uh, the gatherings will include updates from Director Long, appreciating the team's efforts, and also talk about the strategic direction for the coming year. In addition to the staff updates, we'll review Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland, Sustainable Future, Parks Levy, and then the requested budget that's in now. The all employee gatherings are staggered at different times to try to get as many staff to attend and it's for all staff, including full time permanent swing shift and uh, seasonal employees we will also be recording them so people can watch it if they uh, have conflicts, you know they're in training or are scheduled for time off. I wanted to also note uh, the mayor. Uh, last week issued an emergency declaration related to street services uh, coordination. Um, this is really about the city's homeless services that we offer across all of our bureaus. The emergency declaration creates a new coordinating body in the Office of Ma Management and Finance. That uh, work was funded in the fall bump. But uh, the emergency declaration for us, what it means is our primarily our park rangers uh, for all the services that they provide uh, for referrals, um, finding shelter beds, um, working with other agencies that will now be centrally coordinated uh, through Mike Myers uh, community safety team in OMF. The park rangers still report to the director and the parks commissioner 
but that part of their work will be more centrally coordinated in the city. Sadly, I've got two other things to cover. Um, as many of you know, uh, there was a shooting at Dawson Park um, uh, February 19th, and four people were shot, one person uh, died. And since then, there's been a gathering and memorial uh, there. People stayed there overnight. Um, the building has been spray painted that's there. And then there was a lot of flowers and other uh, memorial uh, type things that were left behind. Uh, there was some media reporting on that. Uh, the group has recently left the park. And so we're in the process now of cleaning up the area and we're in contact with those organizers to make sure that's done without any conflicts. So, so far so good on that. Um, for the Dawson Park uh, shooting, which occurred last Tuesday, um, the shooting was actually in the street right adjacent to the park. Um, but of note, that's already the 20th homicide in Portland. Uh, so we're on pace faster than the record setting uh, amount last year, which is sad. And uh, as you know, uh, we work closely with uh, the Office of Violent Permit Prevention through our park ranger program to have a presence in the park um, after events like that, um, that are in or near our parks. So that is all I have as an update and have to take any questions. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, I think um, uh, you mentioned Dawson Park and then you start talking about the uh, shooting at Normandale, I think, and Tim dropped a note in the chat to try and clarify that a little bit. So the-, the Oh, sorry. No, no, no worries. Um, and there was a question also in the chat um, that uh, Nova asked. She's asking who is leading the capital effort for the North Portland Aquatic Center. Um, and I think the answer to that is sort of depends on what you mean by leading it. I guess really it's the Parks Bureau, right? Because it's the Bureau that's going to um, assemble these resources and you know, figure out the path forward. Do you mean I, the uh, remaining funds to be raised or? I think that's what Nova means. Nova, yeah, that's, you want to clarify? That's what I, yeah, that's what I was meaning, like who's leading that or, you know, and I didn't necessarily mean one person, but I just was kind of curious what, what some of the, and it can be taken offline, but like what some of the strategies are yeah. for going after closing that gap. Yeah. Uh, Todd, do you want me to speak to that? I think I can cover it. So we, we don't have identified funding right now for the gap, um, but like other, you know, where we have expectations and goals to provide services and have a gap of available resources, our sustainable future program is, that's what we do is look for alternative funding measures, look for opportunities to leverage other resources to fill those gaps. So Sarah Huggins will be working closely with our team to see, you know, how we can close the gap. Thank um, you. As a, oh, can I just have one follow up, Bonnie? Um, yeah, don't just as, as a resident of North Portland, and I think um, this might be something, obviously this isn't going to close the $23 million gap to do this, but I think um, there's potentially some, some more work that can be done, and I'd be happy to you know, be of help or be of support, but I don't think North Portland residents overall know enough about this project and, and that it's on, you know, that it's on the slate to possibly be done if the funding can be there. And I think it would be really great to mobilize the North Portland community in support of this project so that they can at least use their voices to show how important it is and say how important it is. Um, and so I don't know, I, I know that there's I'm sure lots of efforts around that, so I don't want to assume that there aren't. Um, but if I can be of support, or if or if um, if there's ways to, you know, just action steps that can be taken um, to get North Portland residents more um, aware of what's of what the plan is there, I think that would be really helpful to the project. Because I, when I sent out the petition, um, I had a very small window, but got lots of good responses and people were like what this is happening it was like a surprise um so um and doesn't mean that things haven't been done but 
as you know, people don't always catch every communication and things like that. So um, just just a, a thought um, that that may be helpful for this project. Um, again, it isn't going to raise the, the money that's needed, but um, I, I think having it be something that that residents are really um, mobilized about would be helpful. That's great. Well, maybe we can bring some uh, information back about the community engagement plans for that project at a future meeting. And Rep Nelson's going to be at the Friends of Columbia Park meeting this coming Monday night, and there'll likely be a town hall at Charles Jordan Community Center in coordination with his office in April. So that's great. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Nova. And if I can just also interject, you know, the, the package that came together with Rep Nelson came together really fast. It was a surprise for a lot of people because as you may know, you know, once Tina Kotek left her position and then Rep Nelson was named to fill her position, uh, he put the proposal forward and then um, uh, several others, um, Rep Dexter was very instrumental in trying to get community support. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a surprise for a lot of people that it all came together very quickly. So just to give a little more context, um, uh, it wasn't something that was in the works that people knew about because um, I think I literally got, you know, a message about it from Adina and then I got a message from Rep Dexter saying, can you get this out to your people? Um, so uh, two more hands. I see Allie and Casey have their hands up. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. One, uh, or I guess one more of a comment and a question. Um, I'll start with a comment. Just. Uh, you know, mask mandates are lifting and things are returning, but um, for immunocompromised people, it's still, it's actually a really, really scary time. So there was some great, I'm gonna drop a link in, there's some great, uh, a piece on uh, NPR on what immunocompromised people are asking for to make workplaces safe, including increased air filtration. And um, so I'll drop that link there as something uh, to think about of how to make the offices more safe for people who have been especially vulnerable. Um, and the second is I saw the, sorry, this wasn't in your verbal report, but it was in the written piece on um, the work that started in Forest Park for, uh, you know, removing debris and excess to prevent wildfires. And I saw, you know, you're working with uh, Bureau of Environmental Services to sort of uh, minimize disturbance to nesting birds, but owls and hummingbirds are already nesting. I saw the work just began in February. I'm wondering how long it's going to go because we're like right in the beginning of nesting season and uh, in future years, is it possible to do this work in the fall so that you're not uh, disrupting birds as they're breeding and other wildlife as they're breeding as well? I will get back to you on the nesting birds timeline. But thanks for the other comment. Casey. Just a quick question on the golf bids. Is there a deadline set for when bids have to be submitted by? I'll have to get back to you. It's not out on the street yet. Saren, do you know? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the ordinance right now is just to ask, basically to ask for permission to do the solicitation. And so it's still in development and there isn't a deadline yet for getting proposals back. Thank you very much, Todd. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Um, any other questions for Todd on the director's report? If not, we'll move into the working group reports and we'll start with Erin with the community engagement working group. Okay, great. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so a lot of our um, meeting was some updates that actually are on our agenda for later. So I'm, I'm going to let that uh, talk about that when that comes up on our agenda around um, renaming uh, some, uh, you know, the, anyway, I'll, you will see. So stay tuned. Um, besides that, uh, we also got an update on North Portland Aquatics, which we just talked about in a little bit more detail. And um, then beyond that, really, we just continue to work on a proposal to bring to the board around increasing community engagement at the board, um, increasing board visibility within the communities um, and removing barriers for um, community members to be able to participate at board meetings. So that's still being worked on. I also just wanna give a nominating committee update. Um, the uh, application for the nominating committee 
uh, sorry, ugh, the application for our open seats. So we're going to have two open seats that aren't ex officio members. So we're not do, we're not nominating for that. So we have two open board seats. Um, that should be uh, the application should be posted in early April. So we'll give an update to at the beginning of April. But um, now is a good time to also be thinking within your networks about possible people you might want to send the link to the application to. We'll provide a template email that you can send people. Um, I'm sure Casey might talk about this when he talks about board affairs working group. We're still looking at um, making, we have a board matrix. Uh, we're looking at kind of redoing some of that board matrix to identify who's on the board currently and what are some gaps that we might have where we might be seeking board members with particular skills or backgrounds. We do know for sure there's one, um, uh, uh, we don't have, um, uh, when Katie Holland rolled off the board, uh, uh, her term was up last year. We don't have um, board members that I know of that have strong connections to Native American communities. And so that's definitely something that we're aware of as a gap. Um, but we might identify more as we kind of work through updating that board matrix. So uh, yeah, that's that's my update for that. Also, um, Alana, who couldn't join us today, is going to be joining me as co-chair of the nominating committee to give people that update too. So you might be hearing from her next time instead of me. That's all, unless anyone has anything to add that I missed or questions or thoughts. Thank you, Erin. Did anyone have questions for Erin or did anyone, any other members of the Community Engagement Working Group have anything they would wanted to add? Okay. Thank you. If not, we will move on to the Financial Sustainability Working Group with Mike. Well, thanks, Bonnie. Um, Welcome so back, Mike. Th thanks. Um, my update should be relatively brief. Um, for the current fiscal year, Parks is still tracking fairly close to budget. Um, actually doing a, a little bit better as a result of some lower than budgeting um, budgeted staffing expenses. Um, then also as it relates to the current year, I, I wanted to highlight a couple items from the, the Parks monthly report for February, just in case uh, you didn't see them. Um, first, both golf and the PIR funds are trending positively especially golf, which looks like um, it's heading towards another record-breaking year. I know last year was a record. It sounds like they're going to break that again this year. Um, and then uh, second, system development charges have already exceeded the $14 million projection for the year, which is great news. Um, this number is still lower than many historical years, um, but well above what we saw last year um, during the height of COVID. So that's, that's good news. And um, then as it relates to the, the coming fiscal year, um, in the past couple of months, we've provided updates on the budget process and some of the significant budget items um, for the fiscal year that starts July 1st. Um, that process is continuing to move forward as scheduled. Um, this month, there's a number of working sessions with the commissioners. And as Todd mentioned, that's why uh, Commissioner Long and also uh, Claudio is um, not in this meeting today as they're in one of those sessions. Um, I do think at the last month's board meeting, Adina reviewed um, how the process is going to be a little bit different this year with the, uh, the focus on those key areas, and, and Todd touched on that again. So um, that should be fairly interesting to see how that plays out. Um, after these work session meetings, um, the mayor is going to release his proposed budget in late April or early May uh, with a goal of final adoption by, by June. Um, so that, that's, that's really just kind of a quick update. Uh, we have our next working group meeting on March 24th. Um, I, I think Claudio probably mentioned in the last board meeting that we've rescheduled those um, to be the last Thursday of each month. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or if there's any comments from anybody else in the group. I do want to say I've been out of pocket for like the last month. So I want to thank uh, Claudio and Casey and everyone else in the working group for kind of keeping things moving while I've been gone. So thanks for that. Thanks, Mike. Welcome back. Um, any questions for Mike or anything that others on the Financial Sustainability Work Group want to add? If not, we'll move on to the Land Use and Infrastructure Working Group. Patty. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, <clears throat> we covered a number of uh, topics this time around. We had um, a presentation on the uh, return of the elk statue to South Maine. There had been talk of moving it to the South Park blocks, but that has uh, changed. It's going back to its original site. Um, as you probably recall, the base was very severely damaged during the, the, uh, 
the upsets in 2020. And um, PBOT was required really to move the debris as a, as a hazard to traffic on in the middle of the street there. Um, the good news is that it will return to its old location with a new slimmer base. Um, and it will be located, having looked at a number of different options, it will be located to uh, allow passage of buses on the south side and uh, regular traffic plus a bike lane on the north side. So um, that work is, is underway now. The second topic was on the Rose Quarter I-5, uh, where ODOT has updated its plans really along the lines that parks have been uh, requesting that instead of having um, the previously shown orphaned open space on uh, partial covers of the freeway, there will be a complete cover which is capable of carrying buildings. So it will be possible to restore that uh, continuity of um, activity in buildings across the freeway. So that is all the news. Uh, regional trail grants, there are nine proposed uh, segments of the, the um, um, trails, regional trails to be updated. Three of them are under examination at the moment. One um, at Marine Drive, which will avoid a, a dangerous uh, conflict with traffic, and two sections between Kelly Point and Cathedral Park. Um, and we're expecting some funding decisions on those not until October. So that's in abeyance. Frog Ferry, as you probably heard, there's a non-profit group that's proposing to run a commuter ferry service between Vancouver and Oregon City. Um, the pilot phase would operate between Cathedral Park and River Place. And the thought is that, in, that the, um, the, the terminal at, the, at St. John's Bridge would be on the upstream side at the foot of uh, Pittsburgh Street. Um, so that there is no conflict over using parking which is intended for the park. There's enough street uh, parking in that location to take care of things. So funding is being sought through PBOT uh, with the intention of beginning service next year in 23. Um, North Portland Aquatic Centre, you've already heard quite a bit about that. Probably there's nothing more than I can add um, uh, uh, further on that. Um, and the, finally, there's a, a possible park opportunity near Berrydale Park. BES owns some land there and there's some private land near it which could be added onto that. Um, it could fulfill a, a need for a culturally appropriate new park in an area which has been designated as, as park deficient. Um, and we'll, we'll follow up on that in future to find out what's happening. That's basically what we covered. Um, and we will meet again before the April, uh, a week before the April board meeting. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Patty. Um, I just wanted to interject. I think that the Berrydale Park reference was a ways away from the BES site that we were referring to. I think the Berrydale Park site is a bit north of division, um, and the BES site is actually quite a bit further south. It may be closer to Powell. Um, okay. So, yeah. I'll make that correction in the notes. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't see it in the notes. Um, no, no, thank any, you. Any questions to Patty or any additions by other members of that working group that they wanted to mention? Okay. Thank you, Patty, for the report. Um, Moving on to the Board Affairs um, Working Group, Casey. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. Um, initially, just to note, um, uh, email conversations with Saren and maybe starting with Michelle about next in-person meetings um, are ongoing, um, especially uh, taking in light uh, what um, uh, Ari had said earlier, Ali had said earlier. Uh, the February, as Aaron was indicating, the February meeting was devoted to um, the subject of the board matrix I believe everyone received a copy of the current matrix after the last meeting, and it was agreed that the matrix should be revised as there was too much of an overlap um, and new and separate categories would be required, and also a definition section needed to be added. It was suggested the matrix be annually revised with the help uh, to help with the goals of the board as well as parks. 
use of categories, particularly demographics and areas of interest and expertise that track with categories already used by parks and other sources will be looked into. We'll be looking to the possibility of combining areas of interest and expertise and might provide a grading of board members' interest in particular areas. So if you're really interested, it would be highlighted on the matrix. It's hoped that this revision will be completed in time for new board member application review process. And just a couple of old things bringing forward, um, I'm still looking for comments about possible ex officio members or representatives from particular organizations to participate on the board. And also looking for comments about if there is a benefit to having the work, working groups continue to provide the written reports to the board as they have been doing for the past couple of meetings. And if you have any suggestions for those reports and what format they should take. Or if you're not reading them at all, I'd like to know that too. Um, so emails on those two um, uh, categories would be greatly appreciated. Um, that's really all I've got. Thank you, Casey. Any questions for Casey or anything that other members of the um, Board Affairs Working Group want to add? If not, um, we're going to go to the uh, parks local option levy report. Um, Paul was provided a written report, but he wasn't able to join us today. He's got field work um, that he's got to do for his day job. Um, the written report is there, um, and I kind of went through it and highlighted some things that I thought people would want to know. Um, and I'm sure if I miss anything, um, Todd can. Todd can help me here. Um, but I did want to just mention, I'm going to read one paragraph from his report because I think it is has a lot of really important information. So Todd, Claudio, and Claire Flynn um, gave an overview of the park's local option levy funding in the fiscal year 22-23 requested budget submitted to city council. Um, Todd provided the context about reviewing the two scoring elements of the decision support tool. Um, which includes the service area map and the racial equity lens and empowerment tool. Um, Claudio had given an update about the five year forecast for the parks levy, including the 166 million allocated in the fiscal year 21 22 fall bump mm -hmm. and the supplemental budget. Um, and then Claire reviewed um, some 15 proposals that were submitted in the fiscal year. Um, a couple things that I noted um, in his written report that I wanted to just bring up here um, is that it sounds like there is going to be um, some movement, a $10 million investment um, for decreasing recreation's dependence on fees um, and keeping community centers and pools open um, as much as the pandemic allows. Um, there was also some discussion about some of the performance measures that are in place. Um, my understanding is that there are some performance measures in place. There's 25 existing measures. Um, and the idea is that there are gonna be performance measures developed for each of the parks levy commitments. Um, I don't know if Todd wants to provide a little bit more information on that or not. Um, uh, let's see. And then there was a little bit of discussion about the blended funding model. Um, I think folks who are in the community or the um, financial sustainability work group um, have heard Claudio talking about the fact that they're using a blended funding model so that none of the positions are specifically funded either through the levy or through the general fund, but rather through a blend of both um, so that there isn't any hierarchy there. Um, and then there was some discussion about the goal to reduce cost as a barrier for the community um, and a little bit of discussion about the fact that $6.8 million is um, directed specifically for reducing cost as a barrier. Um, and as a reminder, whoops, oopsie. Uh, Claudia had noted that re uh, recreation services fees brought in between 15 and 17 million years. Um, million dollars in the years just prior to the pandemic um, and that there have been two new programs implemented um, to make sure that cost is not a barrier. There's the pay what you can pilot um, and then the access discount. Um, and as I understand it, the pay what you can pilot um, is sort of um, uh, 
an evolution to the scholarship program that was in place before, um, whereby registrants um, pick the level of funding that they are able to provide. Um, and then the access discount um, is a similar type program where folks based on um, a self-reported um, income level um, identify the level that they are able to pay for um, drop-in type fees. Um, so that was sort of what um, there was some discussion about the sustainable future, um, looking into addressing the overall $500 million deferred maintenance program. Um, and like I said, I don't know if Todd um, and maybe Sarah, if she's still here, want to talk a little bit about that or not. Um, any questions on that? That may be, like I said, Todd or Sarah, I'm gonna rely on you since I wasn't actually present there and um, Paul isn't able to answer. Is Todd still here? I think you covered it, okay. unless people have questions. Oh, Aaron's got a question. I see Aaron and I see Corbin. Go ahead, Aaron. Thank you. Um, one of the concerns I have is that there are barriers outside of just costs for accessing programming. Um, when, you know, just recently, the spring, spring term or whatever it's called, spring sessions opened up and I saw numerous parents saying they were registering right at 1230 when it opened and were 24th on the wait list for programming, both for aquatics and then I saw reports of that at um, programming for Multnomah Arts Center. And I guess I understand that we're in a labor shortage, so I imagine a, por a portion of it's that. Um, you know, I myself am an employer, and so I get that. We've experienced that as well. But um, I, it's a real issue if people are unable to access programming in the first place. Um, and I'm wondering what's being done to kind of address that. You know, what's being done to address the labor shortage? A lot of employers are, are needing to think outside of the box and to not necessarily rely on their old on the tactics that they used before for hiring um because i don't know when this when that's going to end and I'm, I'm just curious to hear more about that thank yeah, you I Aaron. yeah i i see that uh, margaret joined us although i don't see her now she was here a second ago um you know, because we had asked for an update on that. And I know there were a lot of challenges with hiring up, you know, last year after the the initial pandemic year. Um, but clearly there's, there's you know, other shifts as going on as well. So yeah, Todd, do you want to try and address that? And like I said, it looks like Margaret, I don't see Margaret on anymore. I think Maximo's here as well. So maybe he wants to And Margaret's in. here too. I see, I see Margaret anyway. <laughs> Margaret, would you like to start and talk sure. about recruitment? I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. So yes, last year was definitely challenging. Um, and we recognize going into, into 2022 that there continues to be challenges with recruitment nationwide. So we've made um, adjustments to our recruitment announcements, the language, we've simplified our process. We're working extensively with our recruiters. Uh, we had our new talent acquisition specialist start last Thursday, um, Andre Channel. Um, we are looking at new venues and ways to be able to do outreach. Uh, we have career fairs, both virtually and in person that we're going to be attending. Uh, we're working with uh, PPS, D uh, David Douglas, and other schools um, to actually go into schools and, and provide how to apply workshops. Um, tomorrow, uh, Sabrina, um, at, uh, my team is going to be at the Rosewood Initiative, joining you for Wellness Wednesday. Next week, we're going to be at the Portland Workforce Alliance um, career fair that um, is expecting over 6,500 um, high school age students looking for employment as uh, also includes 75 high schools. So really looking at how we're doing outreach. Um, we also have our community partners that we're working with um, that uh, you know we're working with each of them to see what is the best way to do outreach within their community. So like SEI, POIC, NAA, Latino Network, 
um, Elevate Oregon, Ur Urban League, um, you know, various community organizations to, to partner with to really help us with our efforts. Um, I'm also looking at um, seeing if we can uh, obtain some interns, some high school interns, just talked to someone yesterday to see if we can um, actually create a, a high school recruitment team that will go out and do outreach. So trying to be creative and, and thinking outside the box, um, you know, Aaron, as you said, it's, it's challenging, you know, and being someone who owns a business, you understand the challenging to recruit and hire great talent. So, but we're, we're looking at different ways and uh, different um, ideas in our recruitment efforts. Thank you. That's so helpful. I think that, yeah, those are all, you know, going into the high schools. I love that idea of the internship team. So thank you. Maximo, do you want to talk about the other piece? Uh, sure. And I can just, uh add on as part of our levy alignment and ramp up our uh, division specifically um, are receiving some positions, um, most pointedly uh, analyst position that will be working with our citywide recreation team that is going to be um, significantly focused on uh, hiring uh, practice. And so we are lo really looking um, at utilizing that position to continue to streamline our process, um, both uh, for right now, as well as preparing for uh, the large summer hires uh, that we're looking for. And we're already kind of putting into place, um, you know, uh, training preparations and new systems um, for our recreation team. So we can really make sure to continue to support interested applicants uh, moving all the way through to um, being hired and placed into their position. So um, that work is going on right now. And then with the, I think there was another question in there too, with the, the uh, pay what you can and the access discount um, information. And so we are currently working, those are both pilot programs right now. Um, we understand that there are some uh, uh, pinch points that we're identifying. And so we've um, committed to uh, working with those pilot programs through this summer, this coming summer, and really being able to uh, assess um, uh, the benefits, the challenges, uh, the opportunities that are created um, there, and then seeing which ways we can continue to focus on um, prioritizing the identified communities that we um, are looking to engage with and be able to really put access um, for that. Right now, we are working um, on our early registration, which started last term and we continued on this term, which um, provided a, a window, a one week uh, early registration window for our prioritized communities. Uh, to be able to register for programs. And so we're really hoping to, um, to be able to continue to get a lot of information with that and then build that with the support that we can have to increase our ability to uh, hire staff and be able to offer programs as well. So um, a lot of that is uh, information that we're uh, intaking right now and hoping to um, apply that to continued system improvement. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Maximo. Um, thanks for your question, Aaron. Um, Corbin. So my question kind of dovetails off of what um, Maximo was, was um, just discussing. And I was wondering, what is the process for community engagement and how are you meeting communities where they are? And what are the documents that you're looking for or are requesting to, for proof for these pilot programs? Because that can also be a barrier. Yeah, so for our uh, early, um, so for both of the pilot programs to pay what you can and the uh, access discount, we actually don't have any documentation that we're requiring. Um, the pay what you can discount is uh, to self opt in and to select uh, within the uh, structure that's been set up to be able to reduce by uh, increments on the uh, established fee. The uh, access discount, uh, it's a voluntary offer of uh, establishing um, the income level, and then that is then applied to uh, outstanding, um, uh, uh, automatically applied to um, uh, registrations uh, for things that have uh, certain fees. And so then that uh, discount is automatically applied 
uh, going forward. So um, there's no proof or verification. Um, we've removed that part from the, the system. And our outreach process uh, so far has been, um, we've really leaned into our community partners. We have about um, 390 total uh, partners that we've identified that have worked with identified communities, uh, prioritized communities that we're looking to engage with. And so um, uh, for our last three registration sessions, we've been communicating with them the um, recreation program offerings that are available in the know about the registration process. And the last two terms, we we're uh, offered the early registration process window uh, for uh, individuals to be able to access those programs when they come online before a general registration uh, is offered. And then we are uh, continuing to uh, lean into our um, liaison that we have with those community partners to be able to um, just some deeper contacts to be able to follow up with uh, further emails, phone calls, communications, and uh, information sessions uh, where we're able to uh, be able to give the information about the pay what you can and access to discount processes. Thank you. And my last question is: Are you are the the these during the engagement and outreach? Are there people to help um, community members actually complete these forms to complete the the online or what have you for, for these programs? Is there a step-by-step -step sort of like hand-holding uh, community th member through the process? Yes, so we've uh, communicate that information with the, the partners in the uh, communications that we send out to them. Uh, we also have information online about um, just kind of the uh, format, the outline of the processes, and then all of our staff are um, uh, equipped and prepared to uh, be able to uh, assist and walk through uh, the process as well should people need any uh, additional assistance or have questions or um, if we can uh, help out throughout the process. Great, thank you so much. Sabrina. If I could just add on kind of from a partner's perspective, um, we've gotten the notifications around partner like early registrations um, and the call in process was was very painless. Um, uh, the people that you know we spoke with were nice and, and helpful. Um, I would say the websites is, is a ton of information parks offers a ton of things. So that's one thing you kind of have to like figure out how to navigate. Um, but I appreciate the call in aspect because you can just talk to somebody and they'll just walk you through the process. Um, and I know that parks staff have come to like our programming to be there on site to help community members sign up. And so I imagine, obviously, we're just one of, of many. And so um, those have both been good experiences. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Todd. This one to note that the recreation team and our community engagement team is going out to people who haven't been our customers in the past to conduct in-person uh, surveys. That's the best way to collect information or sometimes we're sharing it with partners who will be using outreach workers to give us feedback on the different preferences around programs, but also the access discount and the reg registration process. Thank you. Um, any other questions on that topic? Um, the last working group, which is not actually a working group, is the process of improvement project. Um, I only got a very, very brief update, um, and Tanya was going to speak on it, but I don't see her. Um, my understanding is that I mentioned to you there's an MOU on 11 natural area sites, um, and that BES and parks right now are working together to develop some um, policies and procedures in terms of um, how those areas are gonna be managed. Um, like I said, I know Tanya was here earlier, maybe she had to, to leave, but if there are any questions on that, um, maybe we can daylight them and then provide them to Tanya. Okay, I'll ask her if she can provide a, an update at the next um, board meeting, see if there's anything going on there. Um, with that, we'll move to the, um, the foundation report. Randy. Hi, um, I have uh, 
potpourri of grant opportunities um, with deadlines um, this month. Um, first is actually more of an award, uh, the uh, US, Bar US Bank Parks Champion Award, which we, uh, awards, which we give out um, uh, two of them each year. And uh, it's for you know, outstanding volunteers uh, who provide significant service to a park, to a community center, a natural area, community garden, or um, park-related you know, program of some kind or another. Um, anyone can nominate folks. Uh, the honorees get a direct $1,500 grant uh, that they can send to the organization of their choice, as long as it sort of aligns with our, our mission, you know, which is, of course, parks-centered. Um, and uh, uh, the nominees or the you know, winners of that, the honorees will be uh, recognized and celebrated at our May uh, uh, Friends Summit, Friends and Allies Summit. And the deadline for that is March 31st. I'm going to put some links in the chat when I get done speaking uh, for all of these. Uh, past nominees have been, you know, everything from volunteer basketball, soccer coaches to neighborhood trail cleaners. Um, advocates for accessible playgrounds, um, community placemaking. Um, so there's lo lots of opportunities there. Um, then we have our uh, small grants, which um, are a little bit more money, $2,000 um, uh, grants. And the deadline for that is April 15th. And um, uh, the mission of this program is to provide financial assistance to organizations or projects within uh, Portland that better connect low income populations, communities of color, and other historically marginalized groups to um, parks and natural spaces. And past uh, grant partners have been um, Boise Elliott Native Grove, uh, Green Lentz, the Portland Fruit Tree Project, Sale to Change, People of Color Outdoors, a um, bunch of different folks. And then the last one is a new one. Um, which is our new Joey Pope Award for Parks Leadership, which will honor and um, also provide a $10,000 grant to uplift and advance an individual, an organization, or an initiative that promotes innovation um, and or accessibility in Portland's parks and open space system. Uh, again, anybody can nominate uh, um, on this and you can nominate yourself. Uh, so and the deadline for these nominations are March 31st, and we'll now also announce the winner um, at our um, spring summit. Uh, so some great opportunities for money and for uh, recognition out there. Um, and I'll put the uh, links to all of these in, in the chat. Um, and again, hope uh, some of you can turn out for uh, Carl and Catherine's uh, Olmsted presentation next Monday. Um, chance to you know, see each other in, in, in real space, uh, or um, if, if that doesn't uh, work for you, uh, to see some um, really great uh, public intellectuals uh, talk about Homestead's impact in, in Portland. So hope to see you there and happy to answer any uh, questions about any of these programs. Thanks, Randy. Any questions for Randy? Think about all the people you know who do great things for parks to nominate them for those awards. Uh, with that, we are ready for the tree canopy report. I see Jad and Jeff have joined us. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Hello, Hello Bonnie. And Hi, Jen and everyone on the parks board. Great to see you. Um, I guess we'll just get started if that's okay. And I'll, I'll start us off by introducing Jeff Ramsey, who said hello to you already. Jeff, thank you for being here. Um, Jeff is a botanic specialist too, is his city official title um, in our science outreach and planting group. And Jeff's work focuses a lot on the science end of it including uh, community science. As a matter of fact, he's about to embark on an update of our street tree inventory, which is conducted by volunteers across the city. And before he shifts gears to that, he managed to fit in updating our canopy report. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And Jeff will start us off 
on the report, and then I will conclude the presentation and there will be time for questions and discussion at the end. If, I think it's probably best time-wise to hold questions till the end if you could. Does that sound okay, Bonnie? That works for us. Thank you, Jen. Welcome, okay, Jeff. Jeff. Whenever you're ready, take it away, Jeff. Thanks. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I am going to, I just added in the chat a link to the report that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to try to share my screen and um, show you some slides. So that might take a few seconds. Okay, is everybody seeing the slides? Not yet, Jeff. Okay. Oh, let's see, let's see. Yes, there it is. Yep, now we see the slides. <laughs> okay. Thank you, and everybody can hear me too. Yes. Yes. Wow. Oh, okay. I think there's a little bit of a lag, so uh, just let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, Portland's tree canopy cover. I'm going to ask you all to step outside our uh, natural areas, our parks, our community centers, um, and I'm going to talk about citywide tree canopy cover. This is another thing that uh, Portland Parks and Rec uh, is responsible for tracking and um, and managing. And um, I, we just released a report that um, we are also going to be presenting to council next week. So a uh, tree canopy is is obviously made up of trees. And uh, they do a lot of work in this city. They clean our air, cool summer heat, improve our health, provide habitat, and so much more. You can see a whole list of, a short list of, of all the, the work they're doing in the city uh, every day. And taken together, these trees that make up our urban forest are some of the most valuable infrastructure in the city, providing essential services. And it's really important that we think of um, our urban forests and our tree canopy that way, that, that it is infrastructure um, just like um, all the other types of infrastructure you think of. And uh, it's something that, uh, if managed correctly, can grow and expand and provide more benefits over time. And why do we track canopy cover? Uh, we do that because it's one of the only citywide metrics for environmental health that we have. It's mentioned in uh, numerous citywide plans with citywide goals attached. Uh, it is Portland Parks and Rec's uh, responsibility to track progress towards our canopy goal. And uh, urban forestry is the, is the team within parks that uh, is tasked with that. Um, the goal for the city, if you didn't already know, is to have uh, one third of the city, 33.3% of the city covered by tree canopy by 2035. And before I get into uh, the report, I just wanna um, uh, add one note of, uh, before, um, of just that might be a little bit of a spoiler, but if we are um, losing canopy, um, I think a lot of people think that Portland's already full and that it's really, uh, they might think that the reasons that we're losing canopy is that there's just no room and that Portland used to have a lot more room and it doesn't have any room anymore. Um, Portland's goal for canopy was set over 15 years ago and it was not based on the amount of space that we have in Portland for trees. It was, it was based on what they thought the canopy was back then um, and what they could reasonably get to. Um, a few years ago, we, we actually asked that question, how much space is there for trees in Portland? Is there for tree canopy? And if we wanted to expand tree canopy, how, how far could we expand it into? Uh, 
Um, and we found that even after uh, taking into account um, all the places you can't have trees, you can't have trees growing uh, in the middle of soccer fields, you can't have trees growing in the airport, obviously, um, and uh, you can't, you know, you can't have trees covering every inch of every parking lot in the city, and you can't have trees in places that we know are going to develop over the next 30 years. So we did a report that asked all those questions and took all that into account. And we found that even after that, um, the canopy potential for this city is 52%. Um, and uh, a lot of people might, th might not think that's very believable. Like I said, they might, they might think that Portland's already full and that's, that's crazy that we could get that high. Um, so just for comparison, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which has a higher population density than Portland. They fit more people into the same uh, amount of space. Um, they currently have over 40% canopy and they have a goal for 60%. Um, and New York City uh, has the same can rate of canopy cover citywide as does Portland east of the Willamette. So where 80% of our residents live east of the Willamette River, we have a canopy cover of around uh, 21%, and so does New York City. And obviously they fit a lot more people into that space too. So I uh, just wanna make, I just wanted to, to give you some comparisons. But on to how we track canopy cover. So there are two ways to do it. Um, and researchers have the first way, making a map, actually drawing canopy on a, on a map of Portland. Um, is something that researchers from Metro and Portland State University have done over the years. Uh, pictured there is Metro's last attempt at this based on 2014 data. You can see that in that picture of downtown, there's uh, the canopy is pretty well, you know, it's pretty well, uh, there's a green splotch over most of the canopy there. They're pretty good at it. Um, the benefit to drawing a map is um, it allows you to see where and why canopy is being lost or gained. So if you make a map and then you make one a few years later, you can see uh, where those canopy splotches uh, line up and where they don't and what, what's happening in those spaces. Um, the drawback is that while they are pretty accurate, um, the technology changes. And um, it is because of that, because the technology they use to draw these maps um, and the the data they're they're putting in, um, including the LIDAR data that they use, uh, it changes very fast. And so even in five years, uh, there's some major differences um, behind the scenes, and that makes them hard to compare across years. Uh, like I said, Metro and PSTU have been doing this, and their studies date back to 1972. We have estimates of canopy dating back to 1972 in Portland. Um, but the study that, that Portland Parks and Rec does is based on a random sample. And uh, this, in this, we set points across the city. We classify them as canopy or not based on an aerial photo. Uh, we, we zoom right into the, to the pixel level that you can see if that is sitting on the edge of a tree or not. And um, we have, this study has been, um, ongoing and it dates back to 2000. We update it every five years. And we developed this study uh, in coordination with the US Forest Service based on their researchers' methods, uh, methods that they use elsewhere in the, uh, in the United States. And uh, it is considered the gold standard for um, tracking change in canopy. It's using an apples to apples comparison over and over and over again as the years go by. Uh, that really are directly comparable. And it's uh, really accurate and it gives a citywide estimate. So we have a citywide estimate for canopy. And also this study is built to tell us what's happening within zoning types. So residential, commercial, industrial, and open space. Uh, but because it's a sample it means we can't, we don't have a map. So we can't say where exactly if canopy is being lost or being gained. We can't say exactly where in the city that's happening. And we can't um, answer the question of why that change might be happening. So that's where the maps come in. And um, taken together, these two types of studies can really um, uh, reaffirm each other's findings. And it's nice to have that confirmation. 
So on to the, to the numbers and why I'm here today. Uh, so I said we could we, uh, have estimates going back to 1972. And um, you can see from the chart from 1972 to 2015, all these different studies have been finding um, significant widespread gains. Um, and this is unique among cities in the United States. You know, most cities have been losing canopy over that time, especially this century. Um, and Portland's been a real success story that we've been able to add hundreds of thousands of people to our city during this time, yet um, expand our canopy and the services that the canopy provides our residents. And um, it's been a real point of pride uh, for us in the urban forestry department. Um, and you can see from 2015 to 2020, our latest report is finding that uh, those gains seem to, to be over. Um, and there's some uncertainty to the exact number just due to the nature of our study. It's based on a sample. But after looking at those 4,000 points, um, our report's estimating that we lost over 800 acres of canopy uh, in those five years. And um, that uh, is the equivalent of losing a Mount Tabor Park size chunk of canopy in the city every year for the past five years. So it is a pretty dramatic finding in that sense, especially after seeing gains for so long after um, in the previous decades. So our, uh, our canopy cover estimate is now 29.8%. That's down from 30.7% in 2015. And uh, I mentioned that, that our study uh, estimates the canopy change within zones as well, and that this, these losses were found across all zoning types. So residential, commercial, industrial, and open space zones all had losses in canopy over these past five years. So some things to consider here are that uh, a lot has happened in those five years. <laughs> Some of it really good for uh, Portland's tree canopy. Uh, probably first and foremost is Title 11, uh, our city's tree code, uh, which provides improved tree protection and increased um, funding for tree planting, went into effect on January 1st, 2015. So um, the losses that we are finding um, are despite the fact that thousands of trees have been preserved due to um, new regulations put in place uh, in 2015. And funding for thousands of plantings has, <laughs> has been available uh, and, uh, since then as well. Um, so uh, we're, we are certain that, that Title 11 helped mitigate some of the losses that we found in this, in this report, and it, it could have been worse. But uh, these losses are despite um, those improved regulations. Um, and then my next two points are really get to the, the impacts of canopy loss and who, who is impacted by canopy loss in the city and who um, has the ability to withstand some of those losses. So high canopy areas um, are really insulated from losses even within their own neighborhood because um, just Looking at where we found gains with our study, nine times out of 10, a canopy gain came from a mature tree, a large tree that was already well-established in a neighborhood. Those are the trees that are expanding um, our canopy where we find canopy expansion. It's the plantings that we do today really don't add to our tree canopy for another you know, 10 years down the road as when they start contributing to that overall citywide canopy. And when you think about it that way, um, if you're in a high canopy area and you have a lot of mature trees, you have a, the ability to really mitigate any losses that happen even locally. Um, and so those losses that um, you might have in your neighborhood are really um, outpaced by the gains in many cases. And so um, the, the next point is just uh, kind of reiterating that is that if you're seeing losses around the city, and some places have the ability to mitigate those losses and other places don't because they don't have mature trees, they don't have existing canopy, um, or at least as much of it. Uh, 
uh, that accelerates the inequality we already see um, in the in the canopy cover of the city. And that's something that is is very top of mind for us at urban forestry is um, every day where we are working to undo the inequality that we already see in the city's canopy cover and the, the lack of services that some uh, neighborhoods have from our urban forest. And um, canopy loss, unfortunately, is putting us on the wrong track for that, for undoing that. And I have just one more slide before I hand it to Jen. I just wanted to show you a sneak peek um, of there are, uh, like I said, Portland State University and Metro both work on making um, maps of canopy cover. And this is this is a slide that will be presented by Dr. Vivek Shandas next week um, on his labs. Uh, they've they've been looking at uh, canopy cover change over a really similar time period, 2014 to 2020. And um, because they're making a map, they can they can show where exactly gains and losses are being seen. And um, without getting too far into the details of it, since it's his study, not mine, um, purple means loss and darker purple means the most lost in that map there. And so you can see that this is really a worst case scenario, East Portland, which often has um, lower canopy cover than uh, other areas of the city is experiencing the the highest rates of loss, um, according to their study. So the inequality, like I said, the inequality that we already have in the city's tree canopy and the services that it provides, um, his lab's findings are indicating that um, the canopy loss we're seeing uh, is, is accelerating that inequality, unfortunately. So it's, it's pretty concerning finding. But it does confirm uh, what our report found uh, in terms of uh, overall citywide loss. So with that, I'll hand over to Jen, and I think we'll take questions at the end. I see some hands, but. Thank you, Jeff. So as Jeff mentioned, we are in parks very focused on our tree canopy in the city and consider it uh, like infrastructure to kind of bring it up in people's minds to at least on par with built infrastructure like roads and bridges and sewer pipes and things like that, water systems. Um, and as we do that, we are have been working in a number of areas to try to preserve, steward, and expand the city's tree infrastructure or urban forest. And the ways that we've, some of the ways that we've done that to date include this ongoing canopy measurement and reporting out, which Jeff just walked us all through. Also implementing the city's latest and greatest tree regulations, Title 11 trees, which as Jeff pointed out, first began to be applied in January of 2015. And there are many urban forestry policies and programs that support both the city's tree regulations and Portland's urban forest management plan, the goals of which are largely focused on preserving and expanding canopy in various ways. Uh, we have also in the past few years focused a lot on increasing and expanding planting efforts, tree planting efforts, and uh, that work has in part been made possible by uh, some of the fees that are collected through the uh, tree code, Title 11 also have expanded tree protection for big trees, uh, is specifically for big trees, larger form, so sorry, sorry, larger size, not larger form, so trees that are bigger around and taller and in industrial areas uh, of the city. And those are two specific areas in which um, we pursued uh, amendments to the tree code and those amendments were passed by city council. And then also of late uh, city council approved plans that Portland Parks and Recs put forward for improving tree policies in the coming years. Um, we've identified gaps in title 11 and that's the tree code. And that was part of the report and plan that council accepted is our plan to work on amendments in the near future. And that brings us into canopy actions that are now in process. So thanks to the park levy in large part, 
uh, more funding has been made available to urban forestry to focus on uh, several areas that together will, should, we want to help us expand and preserve canopy in the city. And that those include improving regulations, implementation and compliance. So Title 11 is up and running. However, uh, there's improvement to be made on how we implement it and, and particularly in the area of compliance um, and making sure that permit conditions are followed, including required replacement tree planting. Increasing that strategic tree planting focused on low income and low canopy areas of the city, which are primarily in East Portland. Uh, creating proactive park tree maintenance program. This would be to maintain trees on parks properties uh, that to date are only cared for in a reactive manner. When someone calls and says there's something wrong, uh, urban forestry does its best to go out and mitigate the situation. Um, of course, the best way to maintain assets is proactively according to a plan and investing in their long-term productivity and survival. And also updating Portland's urban forest management plan, which is to be updated every 10 years, however, expired in 2014. Um, and now funding is available to uh, update that plan, which will be a large public process. On the policy end, we also currently have a minor and technical type Title 11 code amendment project going on and we'll be planning with these new parks levy funds a larger, more substantive amendment project in the next few years. Um, currently, a number of policies in other city bureaus are being updated. Those have potentially important long-term urban forest impacts and urban forestry is involved in those processes of updating with the other bureaus. Some examples are here, Streets 2035, and the pedestrian design guide are led by the Bureau of Transportation. And these are both basically around design for public streets in the city, more or less master planning what streets requirements are for developing streets and what they look like, which would impact, of course, street trees and space for future street trees. Other examples include the employment opportunities analysis and climate resilience planning that's led by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, the first employment opportunities analysis informs levels of development and in this, in our case for Title 11, exceptions to the tree code um, in certain zoning uh, in town and the climate resilience planning trees play a significant role in that work that BPS leads. Another distinct opportunity is in the broader Parks and Recreation Sustainable Future Project, which I know you're all familiar with. So um, overarching the operations levy that we're currently focused on is a continuing effort to find dedicated, uh, sure funding for park services into the future. And a specific goal in the Sustainable Future Project is to find a way to fund street tree maintenance so that responsibility can be taken on by the city, by parks. Uh, right now, adjacent property owners are responsible for maintaining, maintaining street trees. And we know that this is a significant burden and barrier on adjacent property owners, particularly in the communities that are lower income and low canopy where tree services are lacking. So our next steps that are planned, um, first the canopy monitoring report is already online for you all to peruse at your leisure. And I know Jeff put that link in the chat for you. Um, we also will be presenting this report to city council for their information next week. And uh, in the works right now is a resolution for council to consider adopting. Uh, and parts of that re resolution include aligning bureau work around trees. So getting broad support and um, motion around trees across the city, not just from parks. Um, and also finding other areas of improvement for protecting and expanding tree canopy. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I see Allie's hand up, then Randy's hand. I think Randy was first. Oh, go ahead. Um, thank you, Randy. Uh, my question is, I saw that you noted you hope to make additional changes to the tree code. I was wondering if that includes um, heavy industrial lands, since those 
uh, have been exempted and are next to the Willamette, Columbia really sensitive, you know, in the Columbia Slough, really sensitive habitats as well as lower income, adjacent to lower income and communities of color. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, Allie. Um, yes, that is part of the plan that we have. We'll really, the plan right now is to review the code for all areas of potential substantive amendments that might be made. And of course, that's a, a, a large public process and folks like you will be able to weigh in and advise on that as well. The present project, however, is focused really just on more minor amendments. And that is not one of them because it is a, a substantive amendment that will um, we're sure have some competing opinions on it. Um, I'll also point out that just in the past couple years, some improvements were made for industrial and commercial areas. Um, according to Title 11 in the past, all of the areas zoned commercial industrial, well, not all, but many um, were exempt from tree protection and planting regulations. And that changed for properties that are owned by the city in those areas. It, it persists for private properties. Thanks for the question. Um, thanks for the analysis. I look forward to delving deep into the report. Um, I guess it doesn't come as any great surprise uh, that there would be a reduction in, in, in tree cover in East Portland because there has been a, you know extraordinary amount of development in the last you know ten years. That's really where um, you know a lot of the focus of development has been. And so you know previously vacant lands you know are um, you know, the trees there are, you know, supplanted by, you know, new development, much of it housing. Um, so we have some kind of competing agendas. But what, what I'm curious about, is there any, um, in the analysis and the data, is there any way of, of figuring in um, the new trees that have been required with that development as to what kind of canopy they will uh, produce you know, in the next 10 years, because that would seem to be an important thing to un understand. Um, uh, because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of new trees going in with each development, maybe there should be more, but just in terms of that kind of, um, you know, that kind of data point, I'm wondering if that figured into the report at all. So Jeff, could you answer that? And I may add on when you're done or not. Sure. Yeah, this report is really just focused on um, tree canopy cover at the, you know, at the moment, uh, in this, in this case, 2020. Um, but we do, like you say, we do, uh, a lot of trees are required to be planted and we do have data for, for that in many cases. Um, and as part of our efforts, that sort of program evaluation around how is title 11 performing, um, we do regularly look at, um, trees that have been required um, and trees that get removed and trying to quantify the impacts that um, that we see. I think it's um, the permitting, the permitting data is not a complete picture. So I, uh, I'm always a little bit hesitant to, to say these trees got planted and they're in the can and they're, they're going to equal canopy at this moment. It's really um, the proof is in the pudding. I think, and then uh, Jen talked about exemptions, and there are a lot of places that are exempt from those tree um, planting or preservation um, requirements. And um, like, for instance, every lot under under five thousand square feet uh, is exempt from tree preservation requirements and development. And that's a huge portion of the city, right? That's um, that's most that's most uh, lots uh, on the east side you know, especially the inner east side. So, um, and that's that's data we just don't have. Uh, and then just one more thing is preservation, you know, planting is one thing and trees will grow. But like I mentioned, trees planted take a long time to, to really add to canopy. So preservation, I think is um, the key, at least holding our canopy steady, if not growing it is, is really around preservation in which trees get preserved. Um, during development. Yeah, it seems like with the new zoning regulations, I mean, I'm already seeing it in my neighborhood uh, walks, you know, seeing six plexus go up where on 5,000, you know, square foot lots that we're going to see, um, uh, you know, a, a, a loss of, of, of preservation trees and, you know, you know, in theory, in the service of, of providing more housing, which we also desperately need. So, um, so yeah, that, that sort of future tense look at the canopy would seem to be important in terms of 
understanding um you know how well things are working um uh, because we're you know if we're going to house people we're going to lose more trees that's kind of what's going to happen um I, I don't see any way around that so um you know i guess the other thing is i, I you know i haven't read followed pbots um you know street guidelines that you mentioned um but it kind of seems like if we're going to try to mitigate for that loss uh, in the interest of housing people um that we need to you know look at more public lands meaning you know maybe possible streets possible i mean we we have we have more streets than we need or we have more street space than we need um and so i'd be really curious if there's any you know models out there um you know in cities that uh, uh you know to, to follow that have you know looked at not just you know regulating you know trees for through private development um you know in, but really looking at new kinds of spaces for trees ken you want to answer that i i didn't hear a question in that um, oh, mo models for for finding. Yeah, more space I mean there are countries. other cities. I mean, you mentioned Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're facing the same kind of housing crisis we are, um, but you know, I, I'm wondering if there's any any other models that look beyond private land. Uh, there are, Randy, many cities that regulate trees in one form or another, and when we are working on code amendments, we always look to them to see what lessons can be learned and what modes can be adapted for Portland. Maybe just a comment on the streets 2035 work, which is combination of PBOT, water, BES, parks through urban forestry. To your point, Randy, you know, there's policy decisions about, to be made about how close we're willing to put a tree next to other infrastructure and what you know, what, what do we prioritize for infrastructure, whether it's fiber line, water lines, sewer lines, parking spaces, or trees, you know, th those things are all playing off each other. And that's that work's happening right now. So I think for those of you that care about trees, you might want to <laughs> let your voice be heard. <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, you know, maybe I didn't phrase my question well, um, but, uh, you know, to give a concrete example of an opportunity that um, you know, I mean, we've got a bunch of, you know, miles and miles of unpaved streets in East Portland. Um, uh, you know, Peabot a few years back kind of like, you know, admitted that they're never going to pave, pave those streets and started graveling them um, and, uh, you know, to make them better. Um, but are, the, are, are things like that an opportunity, um, you know, to increase canopy in East Portland that, you know, is, is not... Um, antithetical to the idea of cutting trees down to house more people. Hmm. Yeah, certainly that's an opportunity and there are myriad examples of different types of situations and designs where trees can be retained or trees can be planted. Um, and also, Randy, I would say when it comes to developing property, there are opportunities as well. There are a number of good examples in the city where Housing has been increased, but existing trees have been retained or trees have been added. Um, of course, it is a there is a balancing act that happens there. Um, but as that report that we've done about future canopy potentials has stated, um, there are lots of opportunities like the ones you're talking about across the city um, if we choose to activate them. I yeah, see well, Dr. The reading report, thanks. Great. I see Dr. Yeah. Corbin's hand, I think, went up next. Yeah, Corbin and then Alejandro. Oh, thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a couple questions regarding, and I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So when you are planting these trees, are you thinking what types are you planting and are you considering um, those neighborhoods that are more burdened by pollution that the trees that are being planted there are hopefully female trees and not necessarily heavy pollinators in the sense of causing more particulate matter to to be in those neighborhoods and possibly cause a, a exacerbate already uh, community members that might have respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we do look uh, very specifically at species selection and there are a number of criteria that we look at. 
um, among those are trying to maximize those services and benefits that we get from trees. So we, we choose trees that do more of the things we need, including reducing urban heat island effect, cleaning air pollution, those sorts of things. Also, how will they survive in the environment is really important. Uh, the city is not the best place to be a tree, um, especially if it's a street. So we have to look at that carefully. And um, we also are looking for climate resilient species. As we get drier and hotter, it's increasingly hard to be a tree and even harder to plant and establish new trees. Um, and diversity. So a diversity of trees means we have more resilience and a robust future ahead of us. To my knowledge, we haven't looked specifically, Dr. Corbin, at uh, potential allergens from trees. Um, I know that we've looked, we've taken some off the list that have created issues. We, we have a list that we update, lists that we update every three years for street trees specifically. Um, we have taken some trees off the list when they've been found to be a real problem around maintenance, but I, I don't know that there's a specific um, pollen criterion Jeff, you could maybe speak to that, but thanks for bringing it up. If we don't have one, we can look at that. Jeff, do yeah, you have any you know, most, that? most trees have both male and female parts. Really few species um, have just male or female. And um, many of those that we, we actually, like a ginkgo, for instance, a tree can be male or female. Um, we say don't plant the females because they have really stinky fruit uh, that nobody likes. Uh, so all the ginkgos you see are male trees, but you're right um, that those male trees are, they have pollen, right? And so they are, um, they are, they do generate um, pollen. So that, that is a balancing thing uh, when it comes to the benefits of trees. We try to minimize some of the, the disadvantages of trees, but sometimes that inadvertently will add to things like pollen in the air. And if I can ask a follow-up question, because um, there has been quite a few studies and reports that have come, in, come out that it has just exacerbated already um, sometimes precarious respirate, respiration um, uh, health issues already. Um, are you considering or when you're planting trees to also think through like possibly bioswales and other mm -hmm. greenery um, um, that can maybe have more of a wraparound sort of ecosystem service with not, when we're thinking through tree um, planting in the in the streets in particular? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So uh, when it comes to plants uh, and the various services, including reducing particulate matter and air pollution and, and really um, allergens as well, unless there's some that are tree produced, um, trees are the kind of the plant they do more than other plants, whether it's shrubs, uh, forbs, grasses, ground covers, grasses, including palms. Trees do those things more and better. Um, but that said, uh, when it comes to bioswales, uh, bioswales are the realm of the Bureau of Environmental Services because they're part of their intent is to mitigate stormwater, to manage it on site instead of sending it into an expensive wastewater system for treatment elsewhere and perhaps eventually ending up in one of our rivers. Um, so that's an ongoing program that DES has and leads. And they plant trees in the bioswales as well as appropriate uh, lower plants like grasses and sedges that can survive inundation periodically. Um, and the tree part they do in, in coordination with us. Uh, urban forestry focuses on trees. That's our authority and responsibility. Um, and we don't do things around shrubs and uh, grasses and things. Um, of course, I'm sure you all know Parks does a lot of that on Parks properties, as well as in BES doing it in bioswales. The reason why I ask, because it sounds like if you were working together, it'd be less likely to possibly have tree die off, especially if those mm -hmm. particular soils are able to hold on to water longer, especially if there's curb cutting involved versus some of the trees that I've seen that are basically trees and dirt and then pavement mm -hmm. or cement that surrounds it. And yeah. I'm wondering, yeah. coupling it up might have, might lead to less tree die off during, um, Unfortunately, hopefully our, our summer doesn't repeat itself um, from yeah. last year. Right, good observation, thank you. Um, when it comes to stormwater facilities or bioswales, that's actually probably where the city is tightest on getting um, 
good tree habitat in place. Um, where you see just dirt or pavement up against the trees, that is a challenge. Um, and that is one of the things that the Streets 2035 and the Pedestrian Design Guide update are working on that the Bureau of Transportation is leading that I mentioned and that Todd also mentioned. Um, so those types of things, Dr. Corbin, are exactly what we are pushing the Bureau of Transportation to do better on. And I think you're also in a way referring, even though you're, you're talking about the stormwater swales, there's also a lot of more progressive, particularly street tree planting techniques that are in use in other cities, Seattle, LA, Washington, DC, that are about creating more soil volume and better soil quality. And sometimes it's even under hardscape, so under things like suspended pavements. And you'll hear things like structural soils or Cornell soil, um, uh, those sorts of things that we have also brought forward in the Streets 2035 and Pedestrian Design Guide efforts as areas for the city of Portland to adopt. That would be our role to design into street tree specifications. So we're really happy to have parks levy funding to help us get people on board who can lead that effort. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we are going into time. Um, we'll get to Alejandro's question in a moment. Um, in the meantime, if anybody had any issues that they wanted to suggest for future agenda items, um, I'm going to say just send an email to me and Casey, um, and we'll discuss those with Director Long and Saren and Michelle at our next meeting. Um, but we're going to take this discussion, because it's so interesting, right up until our adjournment point. So um, Alejandro, and then I see Randy's hand is back up, unless Randy, that might be a legacy hand. I'm not really sure. Go ahead, go ahead Alejandro. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, this should be pretty quick and instead of like a follow up, I guess to, to Randy and uh, Dr. Corbin's question is, um, I understand that the that the inventory is basically a picture of the current situation, but at the same time, you're talking about potential targets for coverage. Um, I guess the part that I'm missing of this information, I'm missing is what's the, the particular role of the city and in particular of uh, Portland Parks in achieving that that target and whether you guys have a sense of what that what would be the impact in terms of a uh, budget and and capacity to achieve that target okay oh, thank you alejandro it was a little broken up but i think you were asking like what specifically is park's role in the tree canopy issue uh and how, how does that align with budget and those sorts of things is that correct yes in particular in achieving the target uh, the target identify as coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder, if, I don't know if Adina is here today, but Todd or Adina, did you want to speak to that at all? Uh, sure, I can talk about the funding side. Jeff, do you want to answer the first question about like of the 33%, what percentage do we think is covered by Parksland? Oh, um, yeah, well, just in terms of parks land, I think we all know that that our parks are pretty are pretty treed up places relative to the rest of the city, um, and they are they are places where we we do all sorts of play, and so that, that we have tennis courts and um, soccer fields and all those things in our parks too. Some places that we can't plant trees, so we do um, where we can. We're we're working within parks to identify spaces that are. Um, that are really good candidates for expanding canopy and um, with increased resources uh, in the past few years, we've been able to um, tree up a number of parks uh, around the city. East Holiday Park, if you haven't visited it lately, you'll see that um, there are 90 new trees in that park that, that uh, really was, was mostly just grass beforehand. And we're really proud in the past few years, we. Um, Park is going to um, look a lot different a few years from now than it did a few years ago. So uh, I think increased funding has allowed us to identify those spaces and, and find um, as much area to, to tree up as possible within our park system. But um, we don't, you know, most of the city's urban forests and most of the city's available space for canopy is on private land. So um, you know, that, that is outside of our direct management. So I think land area, we manage about 15% uh, of the land area. 
of the city of Portland. And so I'm sure Jeff probably can dig somewhere in our data of how much of the 15% is covered by trees. Um, but yeah, so then there's 85% of the land area that's not within our jurisdictional control. Um, and then Jen mentioned this a little bit in her presentation about sustainable future program, looking at street tree maintenance. Um, there's federal stimulus funds. We have a request in for two years of enhanced street tree, street, or tree planting uh, as part of the federal stimulus dollars. So that's in this budget request. It's about $3 million um, that we have in there. And then we continue to look for other funding opportunities, whether it's capital funding, we've been trying to figure that out of like, how do we have a capital funded uh, tree planting program within parks that kind of meets the accounting rules. And I don't know, you wanna add anything else to that, Jen? Uh, Clean Energy Fund, Portland Clean Energy Fund is another source that I think we can you know, hopefully have future discussions with Bureau of Planning and Sustainability who manages that fund. Yeah, uh, I, I could add too, um, you know, the parks levy, one of our goals with that new funding that we've never had before is, is building kind of the baseline um, people and programs that we can then leverage funds like Todd is talking about. So plant tree planting is a good example. Um, it's pretty hot item for a lot of folks across the country right now, as I would think it should be. And there are funds like ARPA, like we're talking about, that can be used for that. Um, what's been critical for us is getting the folks in who can actually work on the grants and deliver the on the funding that we get for those. Um, so that's been really helpful. I'll also say that, you know, as the levy implementation continues, we continue in urban forestry to think very strategically on uh, what are the services we need to deliver according to the current Healthy Parks Healthy Program project, as well as the Portland Urban Forest Management Plan, and really trying to right size the people and equipment that we have to do that. Thanks. Appreciate the clarification. Any other, it looks like Bonnie had to drop off and we're kind of dwindling now. Does anybody have any other um, questions or comments? Otherwise, I really appreciate the presentation. It was, it was really good. Um, and thank you, Todd, for filling in for uh, Adina. Um, if that's it, um, I'm going to say that the meeting is adjourned and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.